Well, a flywheel is force and friction, right? And in 2019, right, the key to uh, any company's scale isn't really the product, it's the way in which you help people position it, the sales and marketing process. And you and I were talking about it. it's not really sales and marketing like it was in 2003, shmarketing. I'm Shayna, I love dogs, I trip a lot, and I happen to have a knack for making pretty sweet videos for businesses. But the more videos we made, the more questions I got about how video and other content can be leveraged to make a bigger impact in their marketing. I mean, 44% of marketers say that producing content is their biggest challenge, yet content marketing is 62% less expensive than outbound and produces three times more leads. Now, I know a lot, but I certainly don't know it all, so I made it my mission to talk with content kings, queens, and bosses to learn as much as I could about crushing content marketing, and I'm taking you along with me. Welcome to the Content Coalition. All right, guys, I'm super, super excited about today's episode of the Content Coalition. I have the man, the myth, the legend, Dan Tyre. Thank Woo! you very much. You're always excited. It's not just me. <laughs> it's not just the coffee either. I, right. Well, I'm, I'm generally excited, but I'm like extra, extra next level excited. That's what I'm going today. for. It's all the big energy, right? Of uh, course. I could like say like, dopey things and people would still cheer. The last <laughs> presentation I did in uh, Scottsdale, that was unbelievable. I keynoted uh, in front of uh, 500 uh, consultants. They gave me a standing ovation before I got on the stage. I'm like, wow, I need to take this audience with me everywhere I go. Right? Super fun. And uh, where are we? We are at Galvanize. Yeah. First of all, this place is it's in Phoenix downtown. It's an incredible space. It was so cool because when we called and we were like, hey, Dan was thinking about doing the interview there. They were like, yes, yes, yes. Anything he wants. So, so nice. So nice. And this space <laughs> is amazing, right? There's I know, I love it. dozens of entrepreneur uh, companies, fast growing companies that are here. It's yeah. right uh, behind um, Chase Ballpark right here in downtown uh, Phoenix. And uh, I know you know that the Phoenix entrepreneurial ecosystem so it's, cool. it's so cool yeah. and it changed so much, right? In five years, right, we've gone from a bunch of white guys talking about real estate to now we got uh, women with headscarves, brown people, black people, tons of women entrepreneurs, lots of them are here, yeah. right? And right. so Phoenix is a great place to start a, a company. The entrepreneur ecosystem continues to grow. We've got all these competitions. We got uh, Venture Madness. We've got Phoenix Startup Week in a couple of weeks, yeah. right? We've got all of the, these uh, co-working spaces that all lend uh, to uh, a great great environment for people to grow a business. Yeah, and I mean, the founder of Galvanize is female. Oh, that's true. Right. I know. Uh, Heidi, right? Yes. Heidi, yeah, uh, unbelievable. Uh, Diane Power, uh, who I met walking in, uh, she's always so gracious and empathetic and supportive of the community, and yeah. that just leads to more and more of these companies starting and then growing, and then uh, some like going public and uh, just generating a good economic base for all of Arizona. Yeah, heck yeah. Well, awesome. Well, for those of you who don't know who this amazing guy is next to me. Dan, you were employee number six. That's right. At uh, HubSpot. That's right. HubSpot. I, I, I know. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Uh, I've been married for 29 years. What you'll recognize is that most of the smart thing I say, I clipped right from my beautiful wife, Amy, <laughs> right? Uh, she's Amy. like, no, we're sitting at breakfast the other day. And I'm like, ooh, I got to write that one down. She's like, don't steal my content. My wife said that. I know. <laughs> I, I know. You, you should. She should be sitting right here. She's a great yoga instructor. She does programs all over cool. the United States. And um, so I've actually done five startups. Uh, I was a bass player in a heavy metal rock and roll band when I graduated. Right. My hair was actually a little longer than your shoes. What? I know. This takes I time. Know. I know. I know. Good years. for you. That's commitment. I, I, I really, I kind of like long hair on men. And I loved long hair on me, except it's, you know, takes a little while. Yeah. Right. When I, like, I'm out of the shower now. I'm like this and I'm ready to go. Done, right? yeah, I know. Exactly. You've got a little bit of time. You've got to comb it out and like the curls and things like that. But um, being a bass player is actually an awesome foundation for business. Really? Right. Uh, do you any, know any musicians? Uh, I play the piano, the guitar. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, guitar players and singers, a little bit of an ego. I don't know about you, Shana, maybe, but like, they're like, uh, I need more spotlight and they like to do it for the personal gratification. Bass sure. players are totally different. Right. Right. Bass players, you never hear of. They're just in the background. They're playing with the drummer and they're the foundation and they're even keeled and they're all about collaboration and they're all about explaining to the guitar player why he shouldn't be in the spotlight like 99% of the time. And uh, those lessons, in fact, I should read a blog, blog article on that, have lasted like the last 38 years. Right? And then uh, I'm just super lucky. I do a lot of things, but I'm super lucky. Uh, my first like real job out of business, I was selling computers. It was 1983. 
You weren't even born in 1983. I was born in 1983. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> yes. You were like a baby, right? While you were in your crib, I was selling computers in downtown Boston. And uh, I did it for a year. I was highly successful. My boss said, okay, we're, uh, I'm moving to a startup. I'm like, what's a startup? He goes, it's a company that small is going to grow very quickly. I'm like, okay, have a good time. He goes, no, 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 I want you to come with me. And I'm like, no, 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 I got a job. He goes, I'll give you $2,000 more money. I'm like, okay, I'm in, let's go. And we started this company called Businessland, right? They had a, their corporate headquarters is in uh, San Jose, California, right? Um, uh, which is uh, super awesome. And we were the first three employees in Boston. And um, the company grew from a couple of million to 1.4 billion over oh the next time. And uh, it was super fun. I went all over the country, did a lot of different things for Rob's, but did a lot of turnaround stuff in different areas. And uh, I fell in love with hyper growth, right? Um, then uh, I left and I started my own company in my dining room, grew it to $25 million, sold it to a Phoenix based company here and was on the board of directors. Um, and uh, EVP of sales, that was super fun. My third startup went bankrupt. And you can't that, win them all, right? Uh, well, <laughs> it was amazing, you know, I'm this hard charging guy and facing bankruptcy and having to do that, it taught me business planning and humility, yeah, right? And I'm right. telling you, it was a seminal part and a lot of the advising and mentoring I do now is to make sure people have a plan and understand what's going on. I love that. Uh, then my fourth startup uh, got bought out by Microsoft. That was super fun. <laughs> Uh, and the vice president of sales of Groove Networks was this guy, Brian Halligan. And when I worked for Microsoft for a year, he went to school at MIT. He met Darmesh. And in 2007, they called me and said, all right, we're starting this company HubSpot. We want you to join. And I'm like, OK, uh, but I live in Phoenix, and you're going to start it in Cambridge. Uh, and he goes, ask your wife. <laughs> they both went to the same college. So I say, can I be in Boston four weeks out of the month? She's like, no. Like, we have two kids. I'm like, how about three weeks out of the month? She's like, no. I go, how about two weeks out of the month? She's like, nope. I go, how about one week out of the month? She goes, maybe. All right, so I call back Brian. I go, one week out of the month. He goes, it's 2007. We can make it work. Yeah. So just by luck, I was the employee number six at Upswap. The first 10 employees, all MIT trained, right? I'm not an MIT guy, right? And I've asked Darmesh, who was the co-founder, why did you guys reach all the way out to the other side of the country? And he's like, Halligan said you were a good salesperson, a great startup guy, all that energy. We thought even if the product wasn't good, you could sell it. And uh, it was amazing. I worked for this guy, um, Mark Roberge. He wrote a book called The Sales Acceleration Formula. He was the greatest vice president I ever knew, right, before Hunter Madelay, who's the current vice president of HubSpot now. He took the company from zero to 100 million. Mm -hmm. he, MIT, uh, Sloan School grad, a, a, a big empathetic heart. And what made him so good, he's not a sales guy. You know, sales guys can be a little pushy mm -hmm. and mean. This guy was empathetic. He was uh, super smart. And he looked at the, the sales process like an engineer, right? He would focus on the critical success factors. And that's not the way you ran businesses before 2007. And so for, um, for me, it was a great, great like um, second act, right? For the first 25 years of my business career, we ran uh, our businesses on gut feel, right? This is what I think we should do. Let's try this. After that, it was all data and analytics, right? And um, so HubSpot, 12 years in, $450 million in sales, tr publicly traded 3,000 employees, leaning into diversity and inclusion, which you and I were talking about earlier, and just uh, super fun. The, the main point is that everything changed in 2007, right? That is a key inflection point, right? When people's buyer behavior started to change. Right. Do you remember before 2007? Yes. How would you buy something before 2007? You walk into a store. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And remember the guy in the polo shirt would come around and say, <laughs> Yep. Shana, are you looking to buy before the weekend? Right. And the little hairs in the back of your mm. neck are like, sometimes you're like, no, 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 I need help. Sometimes you're like, I just need the education. And you couldn't get that education unless you talked to that guy. Yeah. Right? right. And sometimes they were like really helpful and they would give you all the tech specs and sometimes they were a little annoying, yeah. right? Then, after 2007, like Google became a thing, right? So now you would like Google stuff. And w before you make a purchase, do you typically like review stuff oh, online? absolutely. Why? Because I need to know everything I want to know before I make a decision. Also, yes. the educated decision is the yes. way to go for me. Yes, for everybody. for everybody. For everybody, yes. Uh, the statistics from HubSpot Research says 97% of all purchases 
right, are start with either social media, where you'll go to your friends and go, does anybody have a good accountant? I need a new, like, lawyer. My, um, I need a babysitter in this area, right? You see those all the time yeah, on right. LinkedIn and stuff. Or with a Google search, right? I don't know what the other 3% do, right? But 97 is a huge Are number. Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. Uh, Google just announced earnings um, last week, $8 billion in profit, right? Mainly from the Google AdWords that yeah. you see. And so this is not like a blip. This is a huge change in buyer behavior. Yeah. So before you had a sales funnel, right? And the sales guy, you had to talk with me. And I was gonna put you through that funnel. And I don't care, Shane, I was gonna qualify you. And it was up to me whether you move to the next step. So I had all the power, yeah. right? Today, you have as much information as I do, right? You know my price book, you know my competitor's price book, you know what we do in the organization. So that transparency has a huge impact and uh, re requires companies to really understand the buying process. Now it's not a sales funnel, now it's what we call a flywheel. Are, are you a potter? Do you do any pottery? No, I don't. Okay. Do you know what a flywheel is? is okay. But tell I, everybody who doesn't know what that is. <laughs> uh, if you've ever seen the movie Ghost, right? <laughs> yes. Is it Ghost with Demi Moore? Yeah, 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 and, where they're like holding the... Exactly, like, around. Yeah, 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 yeah. Every woman I've ever talked to, they all <laughs> see that. Guys, like, not into Patrick Swayze, but he's pretty good looking. And then uh, she would, like, push on this wheel and it would go around. And a well, flywheel is force and friction. Right, and in 2019, right, the key to uh, any company's scale isn't really the product, it's the way in which you help people position it, right. the sales and marketing process. And you and I were talking about it. it's not really sales and marketing like it was in 2003, shmarketing. Yes. Right, say it. Shmarketing. Wow. Smart, smart, no, you smart. got it like you're you got a fresh, fresh. You, you <laughs> did a great, you did a great the first time. I know, <laughs> Shana, you're not from New York, are you? No. Okay, but the <laughs> shmarketing with the best. Sales and marketing pushed together, which I invented. I invented that term in 2007 with Mike Volpe, who was the CMO of HubSpot. And um, I, I used to cold call for HubSpot, which is insane because we're all about not cold calling. And I would pick up the phone and I'd spend 90% of my time like uh, talking with people and uh, trying to convince them to move. And then we started to get people to drop their contact information on our website. And we're like talking about, uh, I'm like, oh, this is Dan from HubSpot. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, it was just on your website. And I smiled just like you did. I'm <laughs> like, oh my God, really? Yeah. Right, and they're like, yeah. And so we have these conversations where a little less prospect, more value. And I'm like, Mike, we need more of these inbound leads. And he's laughing. He's like, I, I know we started a company so that we can help other companies like build that process. And I'm like, no, 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 I need them now. I gotta hit this number. And uh, he's like, well, I need to create content and I don't have any headcount. I'm like, okay, you can have sales headcount. And uh, he was drinking a scotch at the time. He put his scotch down and he said, wait a second, you'll give me sales headcount for marketing. And I'm like, yep, it's yeah. not sales, it's not marketing, it's schmarketing. And I was just being <laughs> like a little bit of a wise guy. And, um, but it was true. And uh, it was easy for me to say because it wasn't my headcount. It belonged to Robert. She ran the sales organization. Yeah. But um, there was a professor at Harvard Business School, Thomas Steenberg, who uh, wrote an article about sales and marketing alignment in 2007. And it's never been more impactful than it is in 2019. Oh, right? Absolutely. Marketing people sell. Actually, everybody sells. Marketing is actually everything, right? right. And schmarketing, like, uh, you, you have to have your marketing department create those emails. They have to do the workflows. They have to nurture people who aren't quite yet uh, ready yet. And those marketing emails are super impactful for the way you get more qualified leads. And salespeople have to use the best practices and have to be attuned to all the data and uh, analytics to make sure that they're doing the right things. And the companies that have that alignment, according to Gartner and Aberdeen and all the companies that like really dig into it, all say that if you have that uh, alignment, you're going to do much better. You're going to grow more quickly. All right, guys, we all know that the dream, the absolute dream would be to have a ton of inbound leads that are qualified and that convert. And HubSpot is the tool that will help you do that. Their big mantra is what's good for the business has to be good for the customer. And what other way to get great leads and to get people influxing than with a software that understands how to make that relationship work. Now, HubSpot is an incredible platform. We've been using them for a really long time. The great thing about it is they have free services and then they also scale with you depending on how massive your marketing strategy becomes. So go check out HubSpot. We've got a link for you in the description. They are incredible and you won't regret it. So what is the best way now then to give people the information 
that they need in yeah. order to get them yeah. Ooh, great question. to the sale, right? So, so there's a couple of things. First of all, uh, you have to treat people like human beings, right? If you ever send me an email, dear valued customer, right? <laughs> Forget about it. I know, it's humorous. I know, it's humorous. Like, but two years ago, Shana, if I sent that to you, you just like, okay, and put it in your spam folder. Now, you're mean, like you're angry. You're like annoyed, yeah. right? The over the last two years, there's been a phenomenal change based on the fact that there's more competition, the fact that on your phone, you get what you want, like immediately, yeah. right? And that's what you're used to. And if somebody doesn't understand you and who you are and what you want, right? You're like, no, no, wait, right? I'm Shana, this is what I want. And there's a high expectation for everybody, right. B2B, B2C, that that happens. So the first thing is we gotta treat you like a human being, yeah. right? We gotta make sure that we know who you are, that we're uh, respectful and we're providing as much value as we can. The second thing is we wanna help, right? So the more information that we have about you, the better we can help. I don't wanna be pushy, you get to decide, right. right? And so in the last two years, there's things like chat bots and if they're properly constructed, you get exactly what you want. Do you, do you like chat bots? I do, they're awesome. Why? They're super, they're helpful. Boom, and they give <laughs> yes. you what you want. Right. You don't have to talk to a human being, right? right? And like, you're a nice human being, but sometimes you just wanna boom, get right to the point, right? right? You don't wanna say, hello, how are you doing? How's the weather in Phoenix? How are you? We're just too busy. Yeah. That's the world we live in today. Right. And so uh, uh, helping people turns out to be a very good uh, like um, business strategy. That's why we wrote the book, Inbound Organizations, more than just sales and marketing. Yeah. And uh, the best way to help people now is to give them free stuff, right? Do you like free stuff? Who doesn't like free uh, stuff? I, like, I but mean, you like it, right? I love free stuff, why? of course. Why do you like free stuff? Because it's free. I, <laughs> <laughs> so we thought, uh, like, we dig into that a little bit. and. Like you're right, everybody likes free stuff. But the reason people like free stuff is first of all, you feel like, wow, yeah. I'm special, yeah. right? Oh my goodness, all these other people are paying, but I get it for free, right? And it goes on in everybody's brain. Second of all, it used to be you downloaded content, lots of people still do that, but now you can get to value more quickly. If I give you a free CRM, for example, or free research, or free training, HubSpot Academy offers 84 hours of free training to everybody, right? Thousands of people a week download this, and you don't have to pay a dime. You could move at your own pace, and people love it. They're like, oh my goodness, I'm so much smarter. That's part of the aesthetic of the inbound revolution, right? Give them all this stuff. If you give them free software, right, it's more beneficial for us because first of all, we have hundreds of thousands of people out there using that software. Second of all, you get to decide when you wanna to go to a paid plan. Right. If you wanna use the free stuff for that, I have people like in airports. First of all, I, it's, it's amazing to be Dan Tyre, but I'm like walking through airports and people like stop me and go, wait a second, I saw your video, or like your Dan Tyre. It's because I wear the same t-shirt all the time. <laughs> right. right? I, I've got it's six of them. I know, I know. For sure. If I ever, if I wear my inbound organization t-shirt, they don't recognize me. <laughs> but I know, yeah. I've been wearing, I have six of them, but I've been wearing them for like 12 years, yeah. right? And they're like, oh my goodness, I, I'm so sorry. I'm like, what are you sorry about? And they go, I've been using your free stuff. I've never paid you a dime, right? We're like, hey, that's the way it is. Right. We're, we're actually happy that you do that. First of all, you're getting value of it. Second of all, you're an advocate, right? You're telling people to use HubSpot, right? Third of all, in today's economy, it's not always about um, like making more money. It's about helping people grow better. That's the HubSpot tagline, grow better, yeah. right? That's what we wanna do. As individuals, as leaders, as podcasters, as videographers, as businesses, as companies, as managers, and we are all in to help any way we can. And free software does it very, very well. So that freemium model, for our listeners, we always say if there's anything that you can find, whether it's content or a checklist, I mean, you could do the um, videographers or the content checklist of how to do a great video. Right. right. All that stuff you sent me, right? You put that on your website, that would have value to have tons of people who are just getting involved in video. And now they're gonna say, oh, that lady Shana, she helped me, right? She was the person and that creates, I don't care if you call it karma or the golden rule, the law of attraction, or just helping people out. It is amazing how that works. And yeah. like HubSpot has been able to do it at scale and it's been super cool to be part of it. Yeah, and well, what's great about that, like the free entry model, however yeah. you want to call yeah. it, is it's, especially if you're educating alongside of that, then the right people will end up wanting more out of your platform. Exactly right. Because uh, you've taught them how to use it. Exactly, on a, da a daily basis, First of all, uh, people will ping me and say, all right, I think I'm ready for the next step. And, right, it, and they don't even have to come to me. They can do it touchlessly. They just go into their system and they upgrade. And um, there's this uh, process where there's no push, 
right? That's the like friction in the flywheel. What you want to do is you want to make sure it's super easy. People get access to your free stuff. Second of all, you want to make sure that they move at their own pace, right? Um, I wrote a famous blog article called Always Be Closing is Dead, right? Uh, how to always be helping. 2015. Yeah. You ever see the Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross movie? Oh, yeah. Okay, with ABC, uh, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Alex Baldwin, right? Yeah. You know Kevin Spacey's in that uh, as well? Is he? And Ed Harris, we can't talk about Kevin Spacey, but Ed yeah, Harris yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like all these luminaries, right? Um, uh, incredible. And uh, that one scene is the one everybody remembers, yeah. right? Where he's like uh, leaning on the salespeople to push a little harder. Right. And, um, I worked as a salesperson for HubSpot twice. The second time in 2015, I came back to Arizona, worked in Arizona territory. And it was amazing because people had changed, right? There was no push. And so I started just saying, no, no, Shana, my name is Dan, and I'm here to help. And people are like, what do you mean you're here to help? I'm like, you get to decide. They, yeah. were, they were like They're weirded like, out. <laughs> They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm here. I've got all these resources. I just want to let you know, you move at your own pace because I got no juice when it comes to when you decide. As you move to consideration, just let me know what you need. Do you need a trial? Do you need uh, like videos? Do you need help? Do you need guidance? Do you need technical analysis? Anything you need, yeah. right? And they were like, that's awesome, right? And so the reputation built. I wrote this blog article. It drove uh, like uh, thousands, tens of thousands of leads, 3,000 HubSpot customers. Turns out by writing this blog article, people were like identifying with that was the second change. The first one is 2007, uh, the second is 2015. And then the third and the most important is in the last 18 months or two years, yeah. right? What goes on in your brain? Amazing that you want everything just served up to you. That, right. like, uh, that segment of one, that hyper-personalization. And so companies need to realize that. And if um, we establish that valued relationship with you, you will uh, either use the free stuff for as long as you like, or when you're considering uh, moving to the next stage, you'll at least consider us. Yeah. Right? And that's how we've propelled the multi-billion dollar market cap company. Well, you're doing something right, right? Ew. And you're I telling get, everybody else about what you're doing right. So cool. So. I'm a huge HubSpot <laughs> fanboy, right? Um, <laughs> we now have almost 3,000 employees, yeah. right? As some companies, as they grow, right, the quality of the employee uh, sometimes um, takes a step back. That's not the case, right? At HubSpot, the people we hire today are so smart, so dedicated, so uh, effective that I don't know if I could get hired by HubSpot <laughs> in 2019. It's amazing. And um, we use analytics. It's hard to get into HubSpot, but we appreciate everybody who tries, right? Yeah, we great. appreciate the entire ecosystem of our partners. We have 5,000 partners worldwide. Um, of our customers, of course, uh, 50,000 paying customers, hundreds of thousands of like free stuff. And it's been like amazing. Uh, to be part of that and to help more people. It sounds like it. Yes. So um, speaking of working at HubSpot, yes. and like, well, one question, I guess yeah. I'm gonna lead into this. Yeah. How do you feel about transparency in marketing? Okay, so super important, right? Right. Um, everybody sees your stuff anyway, right? On Glassdoor, are you familiar with Glassdoor? Yes, yeah, yeah. Right? Do you ever look at Glassdoor? Oh, all the time, yeah. Why Not all the time, but I mean, yeah, I look I at it to you... see what I should be paying, like what's competitive, what other people are, you know. Of course, and you get a feel for a company's culture. Yeah. And if you've ever had somebody turn over, it's likely that they have your price book and there is like, business is different today where um, you can do two things. You could be like closed-minded and try to like keep everything internal, in which case you're not gonna be successful, yeah. or you can just be transparent. We were talking about, um, in 2018, HubSpot has what's called an M spot. And in the book, we gotta give a plug. Yeah, book, we gotta get that book up here. <laughs> right? uh, Wiley published in uh, 2018, my co-author, Todd Ockenberry, best co-author in the history of books, Right, he is amazing. Um, we, we have a chapter called the M spot, and the M spot is your mission, your strategy, your plays, your omissions, and your targets. Right, and HubSpot has had an M spot. It's something we took directly from HubSpot. The book has lots of stuff on HubSpot in it. Um, we interviewed J.D. Uh, Sh uh, Sherman, who's the CEO. Brian Halligan wrote, wrote the Ford, and uh, we moved diversity and inclusion into the M spot. Right, Good. so it's a, it's a big thing for us. Yeah, for sure. And um, Katie Burke, who's our chief people officer, who's amazing, right? Uh, Halligan has called her the most valuable employee at HubSpot, and I have to agree, uh, very much like right up there. Um, she 
came out and published the diversity statistics for HubSpot, I think it was in 2015, the first time. Yeah, okay. Right, and uh, they weren't particularly good, right? Um, we were dominated by a certain demographic and there was an intent to change that, uh, but the results weren't that good. But by putting that like out there in a blog article, diversity and inclusion statistics at HubSpot and our uh, need to improve, right? Uh, we went from uh, one woman on our board of directors to three. Right, and a person of color. HubSpot is one of 20% of publicly traded companies that have three women on their board of directors. Yes. How does that make you feel? That's incredible, Me I too. love that. I got I goosebumps. <laughs> how do you shelter a woman right. if you don't have women leaders? Oh, and then, amen. I, it, it, it seems logical, <laughs> Right. and you and I talked about this, but it's 2019, yeah. and if 80% of the companies don't like think like that, then uh, we've got to work harder to get there. For sure. Um, and then uh, we started measuring how many managers, how many executives were um, uh, for gender, ethnic equality, age equality, um, in an effort to improve that. And three years ago, it was about 25% women were managers. Next year, it was 38%. Next year, it was 45%. And we release our diversity statistics next week publicly, yeah. right? And hopefully, we'll see continual progress on all of those different areas. And it's never quick enough, and we always want to lean in. But it's an example of that transparency. When you put that out there, now yeah. all of a sudden, it's super impactful. And I told you, uh, diversity and inclusion is super important for me, right? Yeah. right personally. I do 50 speaking engagements a year on behalf of HubSpot. Uh, always, uh, first of all, I won't speak on a a, a program unless they have at least uh, one person of color and a, um, a woman on the dais. Yeah. Uh, what do they call them? All man panels. Manals, I think they Manals. call them. Yes. There's a uh, lot of them. I so. I, not anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. right? I, we, I'm just doing a, a podcast for a, uh, or a webinar for a Phoenix-based company. And uh, there was two white guys and I'm like, no, 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 no. We have to find a way to, yeah. in it's diversity and inclusion. This is stuff that uh, we're super serious about, and uh, we we have to make every effort we can to change it. Um, and so they were very adaptable and decided to change it. But I put that in my uh, at least one slide in all of my presentations, right? Because we got to tell the world we're not making enough progress. Yeah. We got to move more quickly. It's not just a HubSpot thing. It's a like a humanity thing. For sure. This is the 21st century, right? We get to do whatever we want to do, right? And this is super impactful for society. Super impactful for businesses. Super impactful for results. All of the information you get on diversity is if you have a diverse workforce, right, you dominate, yeah. right? And it's hard, yeah. right? But it, it, now's the time to start. So I'm digging in my heels, making sure that everywhere I go, it's one of the top three things that I talk about. And uh, super proud of uh, the progress that we've made at HubSpot and like lots of stuff. That That's talking. great. What I love about that is that like, I'm sure posting that first post with the statistics was a little hurtful to yeah. do, right? Yeah. yeah, But I think that what's so great about it is like owning where there are issues to improve on. I know. Forces you I know. to now make change and make it better. And that, and you guys exactly. have done that leaps and bounds. I think exactly. that that's the only way to grow, really. It, it was hard, and uh, it's going to continue to be hard. It's hard for everybody, right? But sure. people tell me all the time, I can't find good people, and you're just not looking in the right places, right? Uh, if you want good people, you have to make the extra effort. If you want a diverse work, of course, you have to make the extra effort. And actually, the diversity part is a little bit easier. You can find people of color and uh, uh, gender diverse uh, folks and um, different types. It's making that um, culture inclusive. That's really the hard part because uh, I think most people are oblivious about how that works and what it's like to be a woman in sales and uh, or a transgender in, in sales or um, uh, an ethnic minority in sales. And so, everybody's got to work a little harder to get there. Yeah, I love that. Yes. So let's chat about this book. Yes. First of all, you sold like how many copies of this yeah, thing at this point? thousands in the first couple of months. And then for some reason, there's been a resurgence in the last 90 days. We just had a call with <laughs> Wiley and the publisher. And they're like, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, we speak all the time. Uh, uh, Todd and I go all over the world. But in the last three months, we sold more than we did in the first six months of launch, which I'm not. I'm the so same what thing happened? For, I know. That's what everybody's saying. <laughs> it could be the audio book. We did okay. the audio book which was amazing, it went to Times Square. I felt like Jay-Z, right? I'm walking in. Uh, so the story is, 
uh, Wiley said, all right, you, you've sold enough copies, we want to do the audiobook. And they, they um, like, were managing that. And I'm like, all right, I want to do my own audiobook. And they're like, oh, we don't usually let the authors do that. Right, right. You're going to have to, um, like, audition. I'm like, I'm all in. <laughs> I'm all in. I've always wanted to do it. And I know. For I, your own I, I know. I know. That's hilarious. But I guess a lot of authors, a um, little bit more, maybe monotone, a little bit more yeah. cerebral. And that's not me, right? The reason Todd is the best co author if, in the history of books is because he's kind, he's logical, he's a good writer, and I'm none of that, right? I'm like all over the place, and uh, we would, we, we wrote like, uh, it took hundreds and hundreds of hours, uh, but we got nominated to do the audiobook, and then, so I auditioned for my own book, and they're like, okay, you can do it, <laughs> and it was so much fun. You go in there, I had my own, uh, like, audio engineer yeah and this lady's sitting there and she's like all right you burped in that last sentence and i'm like no way no way but you, when you listen to the tape you could hear and i had uh somewhere around 162 mispronunciations because i tend to go a little too quick <laughs> i know so i had to come back and and do it over. but it was super fun and uh so the audiobook i i told todd the reason the audiobook was selling very well is because none of my friends can read right <laughs> they're all like you're a podcast person yeah right, right? right? Yeah. so people <laughs> I find people on the East Coast are more podcast podcast people than I they think do so. Them, right? I think, I think it's because so. they do it when they shovel snow. Maybe or in <laughs> something LA to when take their like mind off. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. For sure. Exactly. I'm a podcast guy when I like travel around. Yeah. But um, so we we did the audiobook. That was great. And um, the, the kind of the story of the book is that uh, I uh, speak a lot on inbound and the inbound revolution. What we were talking about. Right. right? Treating people like human beings, the segment of one, understanding that it's the process of how you engage with somebody rather than the actual product. Yeah. And uh, people would say, okay, I get it. I want to be an inbound organization. How do I do it? And I'd say, well, there's a few things that I could offer. And they're like, they're writing that down. And I was given a speech in Southern California, and this guy, Todd, comes up to me. I've known him for 10 years. He goes, you know, you should write a book. I'm like, I know, but I'm super busy. He goes, but you should write a book. I'm like, I know, I'm super busy. He goes, but I talk about many of the same things. Let's write it together. I'm like, okay. I'm in. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I go, all right. I thought about it for like eight seconds, and I'm like, well, let's go. Yeah. So, uh, and it was uh, very, very impactful. Wiley was uh, super supportive, right? Um, there are actually four inbound books. Inbound Content by Justin Champion, which is great. Inbound PR by my uh, friend Ileana Stariva. She's uh, Bulgarian, and she wrote a great book for uh, PR companies. Yeah. And then Inbound Selling by Brian Signorelli. He's been a HubSpotter for 10 years, and I wrote the foreword to that book. That was super fun. Uh, and then Inbound Organization, about how to uh, grow and build your organization with inbound uh, aesthetics, with culture, of how to like do the right thing. Yeah. And um, it's been super successful and uh, go all over the world doing workshops and teaching people how to do it. And um, it's really, inbound has really had a significant change on like everybody, right? Not only the people using the HubSpot software, but like people who understand the best way to help people in the 21st century, the best people, to, the best way to grow their business, yeah. the best way to uh, treat uh, their employees. And we talk all about uh, like the key components of, of doing that in the book. Yeah, and what's cool is if you go to the website, and we're going to have that in yeah. the, somewhere okay. in the show notes, Good. Um, it will prompt you through, like, it won't, there's a section that it's like, take the assessment, yeah. and it's like 33 hardcore questions yeah. of yeah. if you're applying this or yeah. if you have the mindset to even apply it. Yeah. And some of those questions, I was like, we crush this, and some of them were kind of humbling, because you're like, yeah. okay, yeah. okay, I see where I can use some improvement. Yeah, so it's not about where you are today, it's how right. you're going to improve, right? What we wanted to do is take an analytical approach so that uh, all stages of companies could review the questions and understand how to start. Yeah. Uh, we periodically run these two-day workshops, right, for folks to come in and to build their M spot, like so that on one page they have their mission, their strategy, their plays, their omissions, and their targets. And then they build what we call an inbound operating system, which is the way in which you instruct everybody in your organization how to stay on the same page. Yeah. Uh, and there's sales and marketing, there's back to office. Uh, HubSpot has this, um, our general counsel is this guy, John Kelleher, right? And he is amazing, right? He has videos about how our legal department is helpful to uh, not only to us internally, but all, also our clients. So he has an inbound legal department, right? Wow. Which, I mean, uh, unbelievable. Right. Inbound back office, inbound finance. And uh, it's a real eye opener for a lot of people because um, if they're not moving in that direction, it's quite possible that uh, they're gonna start stumbling, yeah. right? Uh, one of Todd's great quotes is, uh, everybody wants to grow 
but no one wants to change, right? And uh, the inbound revolution has been like out there for 12 years. It's got another 25 years to go. For sure. Right? It, 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 in, uh, these things take like 30 years to implement. But if you ever want to lead from the internet, if you want, ever want to connect with somebody that um, wants to buy your stuff, right? By helping them, by giving them free stuff, by being a human being, by recognizing and understanding who they are, you'll have a huge advantage. And that's what we're trying to, that kind of thought process out of the universe. That's awesome. It's, I love that we talked high level on like, just treating people like humans, like everything that you had just said about I inbound. I, we have an episode later with Will Curran. You know oh, Will, yeah, yeah, we yeah, talked yeah, about yeah. this. Yeah. And he literally, like the whole episode is about how he uses HubSpot oh, nice. with his content. Yes. And I'm so like, if this yeah. isn't in, like intriguing to you guys who are listening, watching, whatever, like that episode is gonna blow your mind. It's really long because he's super excited. And I was asking a billion yeah. questions. Yeah, yeah. But he's like, got the funny haircut, right? He's got Will. like a faux hawk, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, I've never seen a, like a 30 year old guy with a haircut like that, but he's a good friend. He's been a a huge inbound advocate even before he started using HubSpot. Yeah. Uh, I've spoken at many of his events and uh, the guy has educated thousands of people yeah. in the event space. Yeah. He gives away all of his stuff for free. So he's like an icon. Now everybody wants to hear a little bit about well and his business has done great yeah. and uh, that's a perfect example of applying it to what some people would refer to as a traditional market. Right, and um, like lots of the SaaS companies, they all get it, they have to be online. Lots of the software companies, they all get it. Um, the traditional companies sometimes are a little harder to like transition, um, but uh, I always ask, I do a lot of board level work, right? Because I got the gray hair, right? <laughs> you would say the same thing, but they wouldn't quite trust you in the same way, for some reason. I, I put blonde in my hair to cover the gray, so maybe that's what it is. I know, I mean, maybe it's just the way I, of I get human it. dynamics. But yeah. when you walk in and you go, all right, I got 38 years of business experience. Yeah, right. I'm like, all right, do you want to get found for people who are looking for your stuff online? And they're like, yes. I'm like, uh, okay, well today you're invisible to Google, right? There is no way you're going to get found unless you change. And they're like, that doesn't sound good. And like, let's get the data and the facts. I go, if you want to connect with people, then you've got to treat them like human beings. And these guys get it, yeah. like immediately, right? It just needs to explain, be explained to their vertical market the way they can. Right, right, for sure. So we're, we talk a lot about tactics in that episode, but one thing that I promise everybody is that they will have some sort of actionable thing that they can do in the next 48 hours. Yeah that will put them ahead of where they are nice. today. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, I deal with a lot of entrepreneurs, right? Uh, I speak with them um, all over the world. Uh, I, I mentor about 20 companies on the board of directors of three companies. Um, and the biggest challenge for entrepreneurs today is to focus, <laughs> all right? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> this focus is really hard because um, for many, many years, lots of companies were generalists. They dealt with a lot of different uh, uh, types of companies and highly successful at it. But uh, one of the things that we've seen in the last uh, 18 months is that everybody, if you've got a stomach ache, everybody wants a gastroenterologist, uh, right? Somebody who immediately understands. It's what you were saying about the speed to solving the problem. Right. right, and you don't want like uh, to meander. To, you want it solved very quickly. So, um, choosing a niche, right, a very specific niche. The nichier, the better. Is both frightening but very, very um, empowering. Yeah. Right, because uh, if you were going after um, workspaces in Phoenix that had at least uh, ten thousand square feet and uh, were here in um, like maybe Southern Phoenix. Um, that gives you a very defined niche. And if you were able to grow a market share, that you would get all the business, yeah. right? Because everybody in their brain would think, no, 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 just go to Shana. She's the person who deals with those type of uh, like um, group workspaces in that per particular territory. Right. And uh, it doesn't mean that you wouldn't be able to help other people, but the more, the riches are in the niches. And if you really focus on that niche, right, and uh, you'll build more value for your company, you'll have better customer satisfaction, you'll be able to get more customers to refer you to other customers, and it will have a significant impact in your business over the next 20 years. That's awesome. What's, what's one way that somebody could start dialing in what their niche can or should be? Excellent question. So you start with uh, looking at your personal background and your other um, like founders or principals. The next thing you do is look at your customer base. Right, and uh, look at your really good fit customers. HubSpot has a free tool called Make My Persona, where you can go out and uh, you can see that information, where um, you can actually create a persona of who you're gonna market to. And then um, you want to uh, get as niche 
as possible that would have, I don't know, between 100 or 200 uh, potential prospects that you can go after. And then uh, you want to see your current customer base and you want to try to um, lay the customer base over the target audience. And uh, then just spend a little bit extra time going in and uh, trying to make that connection. And even if not all of your customers are going to uh, come from that particular niche, if a majority does, then you're going to create more value for them, for yourself, uh, and uh, get a little bit more traction. That is so awesome. Thank cool. you. That's You're a welcome. great action item. I Dude, appreciate I it. I know, no worries. Well, thank you so much. This has been incredible. I learned a ton. I was just super excited to have Dan on here, and now we have all this knowledge to go with the episodes. So thank you so, so much. You're welcome. Happy to do it. Yeah. Uh, thanks for being part of the Arizona entrepreneurial ecosystem. Yeah. Super excited to be here at uh, Galvanize and um, talking to your audience, and look forward to helping any way I can. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, guys. You are welcome for Dan Tire today. Oh my gosh, have an awesome week and we will talk to you on the next one. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of the Content Coalition. Now, whether you're listening or watching, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel and to whatever platform you're listening to it on because you're not going to want to miss out on the incredible things that I'm learning with these amazing content marketing pros. So make sure you subscribe and we will talk to you next week.